this little picture here is the start of the analysis process for measuring PBDs in a residential dust sample. So it kind of looks like a mouse in this scale, but it is actually a vacuum bag that's been torn open. Um, and you can see the big pile of dust inside that is probably not dissimilar from what you would see in your own vacuum cleaner. Uh, so when you start off, there's like, you know, the typical big clump of hair and dust and gum wrappers and rubber bands and all that good stuff. And you need to sort of take it from that uh, coarse state into something that's um, a little cleaner before you can even start um, trying to analyze the PBDs. So the first step is to put it in this mechanical sieve shaker, um, which basically bounces it up and down uh, and sorts the particles so that you get only the particles that are smaller than 150 microns. Um, and it keeps all of the sort of debris or trash that you don't want to get in the way of the analysis in the top of the sieve and lets all of the fine dust through. Um, and it makes quite a racket while it's doing it. Um, so you end up with this um, sort of fine dust, which is, is what you use for the extraction process. Um, and when we're doing the extraction, we're using uh, something called an accelerated solvent extractor, which basically puts the dust at high pressure and high temperatures and forces all of the chemicals that we're interested in measuring out of the dust into solution. Uh, then once we have the chemicals in solution, we're going to clean them up and we're going to analyze them using the GCMS. So we used a couple of different instruments, uh, one that was on campus here in Stanley Hall, and uh, some additional instruments that are down at the California Department of Toxic Substances Control, which is a state lab off campus. Um, so the PBDs were analyzed at that lab uh, using high-res mass spec. And you get something like this, a spectrum with a bunch of different PBDs and a bunch of different PCBs as well. Okay, so that's sort of, uh, in broad strokes, the idea uh, behind the analysis. Um, and I'll jump right into the results and talk about what we've been finding in the dust from subjects in our study. Uh, so this slide basically just puts our results in context with the rest of the world. Um, so as best we could, we tried to find every study that had reported levels of PBDs in dust and had reported at least these two major congeners of PBDs, which are uh, BD99 on the horizontal axis and BD209 on the vertical axis. So those two BDEs are um, used in two different mixtures, two different commercial mixtures that are applied to different sort of commercial products. Um, so they're not generally found together um, in the same product and they represent sort of a different pattern of use. Um, and they, the, the dots here each represent one study um, and it's a median concentration reported for the dust samples in that study. And you can see they're color-coded by um, the region of the world. Up here, uh, for anyone who's from the UK, Adam, you might be interested in this, that's the UK samples there in the orange. Uh, so they use quite a bit of BDE-209 in the UK uh, because they have their own unique flammability standards. Um, in blue, there's a couple of studies from Asia. Um, some Asian countries make a lot of products with BDEs, so they have sort of an environmental problem uh, with outdoor pollution that has BDEs, but they also, of course, have products that contain BDEs as well. Um, and then in the red over here is North America. So in general, North America has more BDE-209, which is the PBD that's used in the Penta mixture, um, but there's also quite a bit of 209 found in a lot of North American homes. And the, the relevant point really here to get around to it is the big arrow, which is where our study uh, is. Um, so that's the whole world there. And then this is California. Um, so compared to the world, we look kind of like we're in a scary place. But compared to the other, sto other, other studies in California, we're reporting similar levels. Uh, so our bars are all the way to the left there. And now we're looking at uh, concentrations of three BDEs that are all included in the same commercial mixture, so they're all kind of present together. Um, and you can see that uh, some of these other studies in California have actually um, published higher median levels of PBDs than we have seen in our own study. Um, so some of the key questions that we want to try to address with uh, this project of CIRCLE are these. Um, we want to know whether dust samples that were collected after diagnosis uh, 
can be used to estimate past levels of PBD contamination. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in detail, but basically the idea is that since we're trying to do exposure assessment retrospectively, uh, we need to make sure that the concentrations of chemicals we're measuring the dust today are relevant to the levels that existed when the children were exposed uh, to the chemicals that caused leukemia or did not cause leukemia. Um, we are interested in the time trends of PBDs and residential dust uh, over the course of the study. Um, so PBDs have been phased out of use in the U.S. and also in Europe. Um, and that phase out occurred over the same time period as our study. So it's uh, an interesting question sort of a, from a political standpoint or from a public health standpoint as well, um, whether or not this uh, new regulation actually had an impact on uh, the contamination that people in our study uh, have experienced. We also want to consider the determinants of PBD levels in the residential dust. Um, and this is, again, in an effort to try to limit exposure to PBDs. Um, so if we can identify what's causing concentrations of PBDs to be higher or lower, then we could try to make recommendations for how people could avoid uh, high exposures to PBDs. And then finally, we want to look at uh, the biological relevance of these measurements in dust. So this is uh, more of a general aim, but specifically for PBDs, we want to look at how the levels of PBDs in dust are correlated with the levels of PBDs in blood. Um, and that's something that Steve mentioned in the beginning. It's part of Project 2, AIM-1, or Project 2, Goal 3. Okay, so first to talk about the idea of the long-term variability of these measurements. This is just a conceptual timeline of our study. Um, and you can see that it goes from the child's birth um, on the extreme left all the way out to the dust collection on the extreme right. Um, so essentially, again, the, the issue with the control, the, the case control study, is that we're trying to do retrospective assessment of exposures. So we collect the dust at some point um, after diagnosis, and then we want to try to figure out information about the exposures that occurred during the child's critical periods of development, uh, either around the time of their birth or sometime even before birth, perhaps. Um, but we have this period of disease latency uh, since we're studying cancer. And then we also have some delays that are related to just the logistics of enrolling uh, people in the study and contacting them, interviewing them, and getting a dust sample from them. It, it takes some time before we can actually get the dust sample. Um, and to just go through and be specific about how long these time periods can actually be, uh, the mean time uh, between the child's birth and the date of diagnosis in our study is about three and a half years. So we have that latency period to deal with. Um, and then there's an additional year between when the child's diagnosed and when we're actually able to go and get the dust sample. Um, so the, together, the time between when the child was born and when uh, the dust is collected could be as long as like five years. Um, so the question is really, can you make that leap? Is it reasonable to assume that what's measured five years after birth is really relevant to uh, the exposures that, that cause leukemia? So the way that we try to evaluate that question is by uh, taking repeat samples of dust from the same households and then trying to compare the concentrations of chemicals that we measured in dust from the first sampling round to the concentrations of chemicals that we measured in dust from the second sampling round. Um, so these sampling rounds are separa separated by anywhere from three to eight years. So it's a pretty long um, time gap and it sort of represents a, a time that's equivalent to the time between birth and the average dust collection period. Um, and what we saw was that although there is quite a bit of variability from sampling round to sampling round, um, overall there is a correlation between the two sampling rounds. Um, so we're somewhat reassured by this. Um, it does seem to suggest that we could uh, use dust measurements that were taken after diagnosis to try to assess exposures that are relevant to disease uh, onset. And this particular example, again, is for BD99, uh, which is one of the major PBDs. That's sort of the figure version of this table. Um, and the table, in this case, is broken up into two categories uh, based on the interval between sampling rounds. Uh, so on the left is the interval sampling, interval of between sampling rounds when it's shorter, 
so less than uh, 2,500 days. And on the right is the time interval between sampling rounds when that interval is longer, longer than 2,500 days. And you can see that for these major PBDEs, um, the correlation between the two sampling rounds is better when we have a shorter period of time between the sampling interval. OK, so that's, that's uh, pretty intuitive. Uh, but it does give us sort of a place to start when we're thinking about how to design uh, future studies. So if we know that beyond 2,500 days, the information that we're getting now is not related to the information that we had earlier than 2,500 days prior, then we know that we need to get our dust sample with it at least within 2,500 days of the exposures that we think are relevant. So if we think that the exposures that are relevant are the exposures that happened the year before the child's birth, then we need to get dust sampled at least 2,500 minus one year after birth. Does that make sense? I hope so. So it basically sets an a age limit for the time when we are willing to sample dust. Uh, so the second topic that I want to talk about is uh, the time trends over the course of the study. Um, so again, these PBDs, um, some of them have been phased out. Um, BD47 and BD99, the ones with the arrows at the top there, have both been phased out um, officially since 2006. Um, and BD209 is scheduled to be phased out, but it's still in use in the US. Um, so we were hypothesizing that uh, basically the list of PBDs at the top would be decreasing over time, and that the list at the bottom, especially BD209, would be increasing over time or at least uh, staying pretty much stable. Uh, so this is just a comparison between the first round and the second round. Uh, we have the medians shown in the first two columns there, and then there's an estimate of the time trend from a mixed effects model. Um, in this case, the time trend is showing the percent change over uh, the, the sampling period. And you can see essentially that for the PBDs with the highest concentrations, the major PBDs, there's not a significant uh, change over time. So th things like BD47 and BD99, they didn't decrease over the course of the study from the first round of the sam first sampling round and the second sampling round, which is a little bit surprising. But uh, at the same time, uh, the sources of these chemicals are things that you couldn't easily get rid of. So they're things like couches or uh, uh, curtains or construction materials, things that could be in your house for a long period of time. Um, and even if those items are removed from your house, the source items of the PBDs, the chemicals could remain in your carpet and uh, sort of on the surfaces of your walls and in your dust for a longer period of time. So essentially it suggests that even though the regulations have changed regarding PBDs, it's going to be sort of a lingering issue. Uh, and Californians will probably have to deal with high levels of PBD exposure for some continued period of time. <clears throat> um, interestingly, there is a group of PBDs that did seem to decrease significantly over time. It's this OctaBD formulation. But you can see by the medians that the concentrations of this particular group of PBDs are smaller. They're, uh, it's a more minor commercial mixture that's used in fewer products. Um, but it is interesting that that group of PBDs did decrease. And it could have something to do with the products that it's used in. Um, so it's generally more electronic goods and not uh, upholstered furniture. Um, so that's interesting. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about um, before I hand this back over to Steve is that we did try to evaluate some determinants of PBD levels in residential dust. Again, we wanted to do this so we could try to make recommendations about how to limit exposures to these sort of chemicals. Um, so we looked first and foremost at um, quantity and quality of, of furniture, because uh, that's the main source of these PBDs. Um, we didn't, uh, like other investigators before, we didn't see a, a strong relationship between the number of, say, like upholstered furniture pieces in a house and the concentrations of PBDs. Um, and that's probably due to the fact that um, not every upholstered piece of upholstered furniture has the same uh, flame retardant mixture. Um, and we're trying to evaluate this in a, in a different way uh, by looking at, instead of just furniture counts, we're going to start using uh, microscope information. 
where we look at actual individual dust particles and try to pick out uh, source materials that are attached to flame retardant uh, chemicals and see if we can identify uh, visually what that source material might be. So if it looks like a piece of foam, we could say that that flame retardant came from a couch. Or if it looks like a piece of TV at a microscopic scale, we could say that uh, that flame retardant came from a TV. So that's a, a new project that we're working on right now. Um, what we did see was that the quality of the furniture um, was related to the, the levels of PBDs. Uh, so we asked if you had a piece of furniture that had crumbling or exposed foam, and we saw that people who had those types of uh, upholstered furniture did have higher levels of PBDs. So it's interesting, and it suggests one easy way to limit exposure to PBDs if you just uh, try to avoid having furniture like that or get rid of your furniture once it starts to crumble. Um, people have observed previously that both income and race and ethnicity have been uh, related to PBD levels, uh, both biologically and in dust. Um, and people have hypothesized that this furniture quality um, difference might explain the disparity between income levels and PBD um, body burdens. But we didn't see that there was a relationship between income and furniture quality. But we did see that um, our Hispanic population had higher PBD levels in their dust, and our low-income population had higher levels of PBDs in their dust as well. So there is potentially some, um, something going on there. Uh, we're just not sure exactly how it relates to furniture quality or what the real driver is. Um, we also saw an interesting trend uh, where the PBD levels in dust in different regions uh, varied. So the dust samples that we took from the Sacramento area and the Sierra Mountain region had higher PBD levels than the Bay Area measurements that we're making. And we're looking at and analyzing this and trying to adjust for a bunch of different um, factors, but it seems like there are some, some interesting differences between these, these two regions in terms of the PBD levels, which was surprising because, again, the sources of PBDs are, are mostly indoor products um, and not necessarily uh, sources that you would expect to uh, very much over the course of the, over the, the spatial extent of the state. Okay, so to summarize my part of the presentation here, um, we do think that PBDs that are measured after diagnosis can be useful markers of past exposures, um, especially in a study of childhood leukemia where the cases are frequently diagnosed at a young age. Um, and we can try to limit our population that we're evaluating uh, with dust samples to a smaller uh, portion of our cohort. Um, we noted that the residential dust concentrations of major PBDs did not decrease over the course of our study, um, which suggests that these PBDs are going to persist in households from California for many years. And again, just briefly, we noticed that low-income communities and communities of color may be disproportionately exposed to PBDs uh, via their residential dust. 